This is Lesson 110, VHDL Example 75. And in this example, we'll write a VHDL program for a keyboard interface using the PS2 port. Here's the layout of a typical keyboard. And each key has associated with it a so-called make code. 1C, for example, is the make code for A, 1B for S. So those are associated with a physical key. The space bar, the shift keys all have make these make codes. Some keys, like the alt key, the control key, this is the right alt key, notice the left alt key has a different make code. Uh, the cursor keys, the down, left, right, and up keys, have two byte make codes that all begin with an E0. So in addition to the make code, there's also a break code. That is, that's a code that gets sent when you release the key. So if you press key A, the keyboard sends a 1C out the PS2 port. And when you release it, it sends an F01C. So break codes begin with an F0. Uh, the two-byte make codes, E074, when you release the key, then three bytes get sent in E0, F0, 7, 4. Here is a table that lists all of the make codes and break codes for all of the keys on the keyboard. Now recall from the last lesson the PS2 port timing. You remember that the clock and data are both sent from the keyboard in this case, and that the data is read on the falling edge of the clock. And recall that the clock and the data are noisy, so we're going to have to filter it. So coming out of the PS2 port, we'll have the clock have to go through a filter. We'll call the output PS2CF and the data coming out PS2D will go through this filter. We don't need these tri-state buffers for the keyboard. So the signals PS2C and PS2D will, are in our UCF file and they are the names of the pins on the FPGA. And we're going to shift in up to three bytes because remember some of the make codes and well, the break codes can have up to three bytes. So we'll shift the data in, most significant bit. So this would be the start bit, followed by eight data bits, followed by the parity bit, followed by the stop bit. So when you press a key, 11 bits get sent out the PS2 port. This shows the state diagram for a keyboard controller interface. It looks sort of complicated, but we'll go through it and you'll see that it's not as complicated as it looks. What we're going to do is we're going to implement sending this clock and data. So we start in the start state with both clock and data high, and as long as the data is high, we stay here waiting for this clock to go low. As soon as this clock goes low, we go to this state called wait clock data low, and now we're going to wait for the clock line to go low. As soon as the clock line goes low, on the falling edge of that clock, we'll go to wait clock high, and we're going to sit in this state during this phase until the clock goes high. We're going to increment the bit count and go back and wait for the clock to go low again. So we're going to keep doing this. We're going to count and wait for this bit count to get to 11. As soon as it gets to 11, we'll go over here and get the key. So on each falling edge, we shift one of these bits into this shift register, starting with the start bit. So the start bit ends up here, then we'll end up with these eight data bits, then the parity bit, and finally the stop bit. So these two states will shift 11 bits in and then we go to get key 1 and in get key 1 we take this shift 1 
8 down to 1, that's the D7 down to D0, and put it in KeyVal1. So KeyVal1 will contain the data for the first uh, byte that we shifted in. If you press key A, it would be a 1C. Then we go to weight clock low 2 and weight clock 2 high. These perform exactly the same functions as this. That is, it will shift in 11 bits, but now we shift it into shift 2. So this shift 2 register gets filled up with these two. When it gets done, we go over to get 2 and we'll put this D7 to D0, that is shift 2, 8 down to 1, we'll put that into key val 2. Then we go to this break key uh, state, which checks to see if it was a break key. Break key start with F0. So if the second byte that we shifted in, shift 2, was an F0, we'll go over here and read the third bit, which is going to be the same as the make code, and we go through these two states exactly the same way, and when we go to get key 3, that will put D7 to D0 in shift 3, 8 down to 1, into key val 3. So in general we'll have values for key val 1 from here, key val 2 from here, and key val 3 from here, and then you're ready to press another key. Now, suppose it was, say, the right arrow key, which has an E074. Then the E0 would end up in key val 1 here. The 74 will end up in key val 2. And in the break key, we're going to check to see if, if it's not an F0. We'll check to see if it's an E0. If it's an E0 in key val 1, that is, if the first one we put in was an E0, we're going to go back to this first state, and that means we'll get another E0, then we'll get an F0, which will take us over here, and then we'll get a 74. So this state diagram will be a, key, uh, a, key, a keyboard controller that will work for both make codes that have one byte and make codes that have uh, two bytes and three bytes for the break code. Let's write the uh, BHDL code for this keyboard controller. It's going to be a 25 megahertz clock. PS2C and PS2D are the pin numbers for the pins, the clock and the data pins on the uh, PS2 port and then the outputs will be KeyVal1, KeyVal2, and KeyVal3, those 8-bit bytes. We'll make a state diagram, so we'll use our usual state type. We'll have start, uh, weight clock, low 1, so the names of all the states, and state, state type. These are going to be the outputs of the filters. Now how are we going to do the filters? We're going to make an 8-bit shift register we'll call it PS2C filter and PS2D filter for the clock and data filters. We'll see how those work in a minute. Then we'll have the three shift registers which are 11 bits and then we'll have key valve signals that are 8 bits and the bit count and the bit count max which is 11. Here's how the filter works. It runs at a 25 megahertz clock. We'll set the outputs of these uh, shift registers to zero to begin with, and then the PS2CF, that is the output of the filter for the clock and data, will both be one. Remember, they're both one in the idle state. And what we do is we shift in data from here into this shift register at a 25 megahertz rate, and we collect uh, eight bits, that is PS2 goes into PS7, and then the filter 6 down to 0 gets 7 down to 1, so we're shifting them in from the most significant bit, it really doesn't matter. We do it for both the clock and the data, for both filters. And then we check to see if we get 8 ones in a row, that is if the value of the filter bits in the shift register are all FF, 
Then we'll say it really was a 1, and we'll make the output 1. And then we'll wait for 8 zeros to fill up the shift register before we make it a 0. So if you have any noise, 1s and zeros going up and down before it has time to fill up the 8, then we ignore it. That'll give us a nice clean clock and data pulse. So we do the same thing here for the data, these two for the clock. So that's how the filter works. So the state machine is straightforward. We've done state machines before. We'll initialize things to zero. Then on the rising edge of the clock, we'll do case state. So when start, we go to this state. Wait clock low one. We're in wait clock low one. We check to see if the bit count is less than bit max. Uh, if it, it's not, if it's less than that, then if it's 1 we stay there, otherwise on the falling edge we go to wait clock high and we shift in shift 1, the most significant bit goes in from the, from the PS2DF and then we shift everything down 1. When we get done, the, when the bit count gets to bit count max, we'll go to get key 1. And this shows when you're in wait clock low. We'll just stay here until the clock goes back high, and then we'll go back to the wait clock low state and increment the bit count. In get key, remember that we'll get the key value is in the shift 1, 8 down to 1. We'll reset the bit count, and we'll go down to wait clock low. And then this one works, these two work the same way. These two and these two will work the same as the previous two. Then we go to get key 2. Key val 2 will be shift 2, 8 down to 1. Reset, go to the break key. Here's the break key. And in the break key, we check to see it was if it was F0. If it was an F0, we're going to go over to wait clock low 3. Else we'll check to see if it's E0. If it's E0, we go back to the beginning, the first state, and then otherwise we go back to wait clock low 2. And this is wait clock 3, shifting into the shift 3 register. And the 3's work the same way. This wait clock high 3 will either stay in this state, and then else we'll go to wait clock low 3, increment the bit count. And finally in get 3, get 3 val will be from the shift 3, 8 down to 1. And so then we'll take those signals and assign them to key val 1, key val 2, and key val 3. So that's the keyboard controller. We can test it with a top level design. M clock, so 50 megahertz clock. Here are the clock and data signals from the PS2 port. And then we have our usual buttons, LEDs, and the seven segment display. Now we're going to set X key. This is going to be displayed on the seven segment display. Is key val 1 concatenated with key val 2? So the values of key val 1 and key val 2 will show up on the seven segment display and the value of key val 3 will show up as a hex number on the LEDs. We'll port map clock div and keyboard control and then the uh, X7 seg BC. So here are our keyboard codes again. If you press key A say then the make code 1C will end up in key val 1 and then if you immediately release it, F0 will end up in key val 2, and then a 1C will also end up in key val 3. However, if you hold the key down, you get this telematic feature, so the 1C will repeat itself, so then 1C will keep being displayed in key val 2 until you release it, and then when you release it, the F0 and 2C will be displayed in F2, in key val 2 and key val 3. The interesting case is for the up arrows and down arrows. These arrow keys, 
they have mate codes E0 and then the, the mate codes are 75 and 6B, 72 and 74. So if you press, say, the up arrow key, the E0 will end up in key val 1. The 75 will end up in key val 2. Now if you hold it down, remember it goes back to key val 1 again, so these will stay in key val 1, key val 2, key val 1, key val 2, so the 75 will stay in key val 2 as long as you hold it down. And when you release it, the E, val, the e 0 will end up in key val 1, the F0 in key val 2, and the 75 in key val 3. So using the cursor arrows for example to move a uh, sprite around on the video display would be convenient because now you just have to look at key val 2 to find out which code, which arrow you're, uh, which key you're pressing and then you can tell which way to move the sprite.